do my wonderful raise hand. Okay. Uh, hope, hope you can see that. Um, and I'm I'm going to suggest that maybe I'll pick up on what you said. Um, whereas um, we'll look at things slightly historically. Let's go into that first. And um, I'm going to publicly thank um, Professor John Dart. And John, thank you for sending through a really well worked document that he, you wrote in the Piscatorial Society Journal. And it outlines you know, how stocking went on, the, the depths and the, 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 I suppose the volume of it, even back to 1820, 1823, um, you know, people were stocking fish of a fairly substantial size. Um, I think what we've got to do, I, I'm, it's a very difficult one to actually say you're in favor or you're not in favor because a lot of my fishing is done on still water. And still water, of course, is absolutely reliant on, on stock fish. And that too divides because you've got, on one hand, you've got the, some would say the easier fish of the smaller still water, and perhaps the, um, I won't say more difficult because they're less pressured, the greater volume of fish on a reservoir. Now we celebrate the fact that we've caught an overwintered fish on a reservoir. It's got, you know, we say, oh, it's got this a full tailed rainbow and it's magnificent, dee da dee da dee da. It's still a stock fish. Um, whether it's in, in the par current parliament rewilded itself, um, it's neither here nor there. It is a stock fish. Is it any less or greater a beef than one that went in? that morning, that week, that month, or whatever, because at some point it went into that water and it's not a natural place. Now, you look at, I, I, you know, I, and I'm going to take my lead a little bit from, from Don Stasica, who's kindly joined us. John will know better than I um, the situation on the Derbyshire waters where you've got, you know, wild rainbows. Well, they're not wild, they were stocked at one point. They've grown on from um, those progeny, but they originally were stocked. And I just wonder how many waters we fish that we celebrate as wild fisheries were actually originally stocked fisheries. I would love to know that. And the other thing too, and the, what I find fascinating is the growth in our sports since the COVID pandemic hit and it is fundamental it is huge it the growth is is monumental not necessarily in trout fishing but certainly across the board and so how do you meet that demand because if we are going to go down a completely wild trout only water or situation and i celebrate the wild trout as much as anybody but can we sustain the amount of angling pressure that it would get if there were no other stock, stock waters? It is a very difficult uh, circle to square, really. Um, so the question is very difficult and complex to answer. My other worry is that if you have a stocking of triploid fish, whereas in the past we didn't, that can't breed in that, that system. And they say that they will, you know, if you do stock with fish able to mix with the wild, wild fish, and who's to say they were wild in the first place, they would damage the integrity and the genetic purity of that river. Well, I, I don't know what the science is to support that, frankly. And I don't know anyone out there that, that can actually tell me. Because, you know, at some point that probably happened. So that wild fish that you're, you know, venerating might well have come from parents that were stocked. Who's to know? Who's, you know, really, how do we ascertain? You know, I, I caught a fish from the low rich in that was absolutely thin, perfect. It had little white edges, it was big, and that's why I had a photograph of it. But, it was, you know, absolutely thin, perfect. And then I was, I, my euphoria was completely punctured by somebody saying, well, of course, we, 
that was stocked a couple of years ago. It's, it's mended well, but it was stocked. And I just, I just crumpled because I thought I caught, you know, one of my big old wild trout. So it, you know, it, 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 it's so deceptive. I don't quite know. I really don't know how we actually um, square this circle. I don't. Um, Simon, are you still with us? Have we lost him altogether? I think we probably have. Oh Lord. <laughs> this is I've got to I've got to take this one entirely then. Um, so I, I'm actually going to I'm gonna take the um, cheats way out here. I've got some um, points here, but I'd like to see if you could raise hands. I can't see you all, of course. Um, that's the problem with this. Um, there's just too many of you, but um, if somebody would like to open, and let's let's throw this debate open right now. We won't go into all the preamble of about 40 or 45 minutes. Let's go into it right now and, and air some thoughts and some discussion and see if we can come to some idea and consensus of opinion of what's good for the rivers, because that's ultimately our ambition. What's good for us is good for the rivers and vice versa. So who's going to open the batting? You need to unmute and shout. Silence. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Jez, you, you've got... No. <laughs> no, I just, just... It was so silent there. <laughs> oh, right. Well, I've got um, Rob I don't, I don't... Mungovern raised his hand. So I'm going to go with Rob. Rob, are you there? Morning, guys. Hiya. I wasn't expecting oh, to speak, let alone speak straight off. But right, well, you are, my friend. You exactly, are. in the absence, because many of you may know that I am a conservation officer at the Wild Trout Trust. Okay. So I have an interest in protecting the wild stocks of trout that are in our countryside and are hugely diverse. Okay. Um, <laughs> and so how, how, I, do we, how, do we accommodate, how do we accommodate angling pressure on your wild trout? It's managing angler expectation. I think the chalk stream dream is a wonderful thing, but in some situations it is just that. It's people are expecting to see large fish all the time and to have numerous amounts of large fish. And I think in a way that, that, that dream has been perpetuated through generations. And at times that dream can be truly magical. And that's why people come rushing back to the chalk streams and expect to have that high quality experience. But somewhere I think it's gone a bit astray in that people believe that those rivers are always capable of supporting numerous two pound fish, numerous four pounders. And that is actually just trying to hold those rivers at an artificial point. And that does bring the world of fishing into some position where it can be criticized. We at the Wild Trout Trust are trying to think from the bottom up and enable conservation groups, angling clubs, to manage the river that's in natural balance with the carrying capacity of that water. And that carrying capacity is determined by a multitude of factors, spawning opportunity, cover, food availability, success of those eggs in the river. Um, there's a whole host of things that angling clubs and fishermen can do to sustain their river, to make it able to support numerous numbers of trout but at times that river will not be able to support numerous numbers of two pounders because our brown trout are territorial our brown trout do compete for their space in the river and if you've watched two similar <coughs> trout, two similar sized wild trout they will jostle and they will posture and they will not quite attack each other but they they fight for that lie in the river if you put a lot of stocked fish in your river of similar size they've got to sort out that pecking order and that pecking order takes energy, time and effort for those fish to work out where they're going to be. And they will displace some of the wild fish during that. So how do we how do we manage the anger expectation? How do we actually uh, perhaps bring about a I don't know, but I would put a point out here. Is there anybody from the Salisbury and District Angling Club? Because they've gone over much more to a wild fishery. And um, the chap whose name escapes me at the moment but he gave us a talk three or four years ago before I was an officer at the Wild Trout Trust when we were based down in Wessex Way. And he says it's trying to get people to realise that a 14-inch long fish is something incredibly special. If you catch a 16-inch or anything bigger, then that's something to write home about. 
Well, uh, but uh, the natural to... size of the fish in the rivers um, is not as big as many people are being led to believe. One, I'm a member of the Salisbury District and, and celebrate the fact. And secondly, anecdotally, I can, I can actually attest to what um, Tony is putting his finger all over the screen so we can't see a thing, but we've got a lovely picture of, of um, a river behind him. Mm -hmm. um, it's the, it's the Lambourne. Yeah, I thought it was. Um, I know that stretch, stretch rather well. But um, on, and that's a perfect example of what, what, Rob, you've been talking about, because that's pretty much a wild fishery where you've got lots of very difficult little wild fish that are very difficult to catch and great fun. But you've got to manage, as you rightly say, your expectation. Now, I, when I first joined um, Dermot Wilson and Nick kindly reminded me just how bloody old I am. Thank you so much for that. Um, I, <laughs> I can recall uh, on the itching, I was celebrating the fact that we raised through catch and release the wild trout population that we had there from being about one pound one, one pound one to uh, the giddy one pound eight with the occasional one pound 12 ounce fish that the odd person took. And that was over three years. And that was something to celebrate. So, you know, it's Charles, been, uh, you, Charles, you're getting drawn onto the size. The fishing experience, we never- No, but that's what I'm saying is that that's what that river is actually able to produce. It didn't produce three pound fish. It didn't produce four pound fish. No, you, you've misunderstood what I was trying to say. But by careful management, the size actually grew, but only grew to a point that that river could sustain. Mm -hmm. It couldn't grow much beyond that. Now, you've got the odd one that was much bigger, but it's, it's rare that that happens. What you didn't have was a whole bunch of three pound fish, four pound fish, five pound fish, and certainly no double figured fish, which you sometimes have in the middle test. That's the only point I was trying to make there. And the other thing I would also add on the still water um, side of things is that Pete Cockwell and I were talking about this only the other day and how when we came into it, the places like Weirwood, and Grafton even in its early days, uh, certainly Buell in its early days, um, you were very happy with one pound two fish. I, we do say size because, you know, in this instance, mm -hmm. size matters. Um, but over time, and I will not, you know, the cormorant debate is for me a non-starter. It's just that we bred into anglers. I'm actually supporting you here. We've bred into anglers this false idea of what, you know, the size has come to mean. Not celebrate the actual fish. Now, you do get anomalies. You do get the born rivulets of this world that can throw up bigger than average fish because of their environment. God knows how they get to that size. I have no idea. I do. It's Go on. shrimp. It's gamma shrimp and it's all of the tree cover that my colleague Nick Lawrence has been dropping into the margins over the years. If you look at the tree cover, the river there is not that deep. Some places nice. only knee deep, but you will see a three pound and four pounder just cruise out from all of that mangled oh, tree I, root I, cover. I, don't I know it? Off their back. But you know, I, last season I didn't actually see that many um, gamerous there. I have heard there's been concern about their numbers. Yeah, I mean, I did see four pounders there. Well, I've seen them too. Yeah. Uh, whether yeah. one's caught them or not is another matter. Yeah. But uh, you know, it, 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 but, but what I also enjoy about that river are the actual shoals, and I say shoals of trout par. They're incredibly yeah. numerous. So something um, right in that river, it's the, the actual... spawning opportunity is there. <laughs> The food it's, is there and the cover is there, it's and hence spread the the, are numerous. It's the spread of the year groups that I think is so impressive about the born. But the trouble is that it doesn't get that much pressure when you think about it. And that is the other thing that I think we've got to look at. Now, we've got two participants with their raised hands here. Um, and we've got um, Nick, would you like to come in? Well, hello, Charles. Nice to see you again. Long time no see. Um, Yes, as a life member of the Salisbury and District, I, I'll just make the point. Well, first of all, I agree with most of what you've said, or nearly all of it, uh, but what's significant is... That oh, but what don't you agree with? That's oh, an important one. Well, actually, thinking about it, nothing. Oh, <laughs> damn. <laughs> 
No, no, you, you, you're, you're wise as always. But what's significant is that since the, the, the policy of stocking has finished, or rather it, it's not being stocked very heavily, that there's been an awful lot of grumbles. Uh, many, many of the members have, uh, have grumbled that, oh, it's not worth going down there anymore. Uh, some have left. It's very easy for them to replace members because there'll always be a waiting list for Salisbury and District, but that's not the point. It, I think, personally, the size of fish is not important. People do like to go and see a fish, if it, whether it's one pound or three pounds, just to catch a trout is great. Yeah. But, um, so that's that to me is not a debate that's that's important but to be realistic in order to to keep the numbers especially of the of, of the less expert fishermen a lot of people have been fishing for years and years can go go there and i've watched you charles just go there where there was where i thought there's no fish go there and check and cast you've caught something if no, that's only because somebody put it in there for me to catch isn't it <laughs> shut up <laughs> anyway <laughs> But uh, Nick, thank uh, you for that. But what I would say is what, what I think has been very intelligent of the Salisbury and District to do, and I think um, we should not underplay this, is that they have kept, especially done by the, 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 the cart shed, a couple of areas that are stocked that can accommodate the people that aren't quite so proficient maybe at those wild fish. And I think we ought to think in terms of that. I, but I, I'm, I'm back with the, the size argument. I think what we've got to do, um, and, and you know, that the, the, it was absolutely accurate, is that we must alter the perception of what size constitutes a great fish. Um, so uh, it's how we manage that, and it's how we manage the anglers, and other countries seem to have done it a damn sight better than we have, and I've got, um, I've got somebody with their hand up looking very patient and, and <laughs> go, 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 go. Which one? It's you, sir. <laughs> and me. You were first. I can't, I, you, I, I, um, I can't call you Annie. No, um, please, please, Annie. Don't. Uh, please don't. Please <laughs> don't. <laughs> um, yes, I, I did send an email to Simon last night, but obviously I don't know whether you, Charles, you had sight of it or not. Uh, which one would that be? Um, it'll be from Annie, I expect. <laughs> it's about um, four of us that have three friends and myself fish um, all over the country, really, as a right. rather no. a somewhat geriatric group. Um, but the point I was actually trying to make was that um, we, we fish all over from chalk streams up and then up to Yorkshire and down into Wiltshire and all, all over the place. And although we, we do fish some, one or two waters that have wild fish in, which we, we greatly enjoy, um, for those of us who are not possibly quite as skilled as some of you guys, um, and people who have limited time, um, it's nice to go somewhere where you can actually catch some fish and, and see them. And for that reason, I think that um, stocking in, in sort of limited demands probably is, is, is a, an excellent idea. And if we are to encourage um, people to become fishermen, which, which I think is a great thing to do, uh, especially in these dark days, um, we, we, we need to, to have places where they can go and actually um, see and catch fish. It also helps the, the associated trades like fish farms and um, the tackle makers, et cetera, et cetera, who, who rely on, on the fishermen for their income. So I, I think it would be unwise to um, demonize the people who are stocking their waters um, too, too greatly, really. And that, that's my outlook. I've, I've only just got really one observation that we actually do accommodate um, for those sort of people, we, they're called still waters. And many people cut their teeth on small still waters, especially, and then gravitate onto rivers. And it's a natural progression for them to actually, to climb the rungs of the ladder to where they want to go ultimately. You know, some will go out to reservoirs and see that as a, um, as, as the high, high point of that ladder. Others will gravitate, as I've said, to rivers. 
and a more difficult one. I think um, I think we've got, you know, I, I, I hear what you're saying and I, I wouldn't want to alienate anglers just purely on difficulty, but let's, let's go to a few others because we've got so many people wanting to say things that um, um, let's, let's, let's go to, um, I'm going to go to uh, Kieran. Um, off you Hi. go, Kieran. I know you of old, so there we are. Hi, Charles. Hi, everyone. I'm, I just I'm wanted, really well. I'm really I, well. I just wanted to build on what other people were saying, and there's something that about changing anglers' perspectives, because as, a, as on our waters, I'm constantly surprised about how many people still want to take a fish for the table, and I think that's another factor that comes into stocking over fishing for wild fish because as somebody has fished on my waters for a few seasons I personally had never taken a fish out other you know for even stocked or wild but I'm constantly surprised by the the expectation that an angler wishes to take a, a fish from a river whether it's you know brown trout to the table and I think that's a big factor in in trying to educate people's mentality. I think one thing, Kieran, with that, and it's something I've, I've actually taken to the United States, um, I thought re relatively bravely, and I've said, look, in order to justify what we do, and is, is this, this is gonna find a chord with some and not with others, um, is I feel I have to take the odd fish to justify what I do in, in a sport that I participate in, because if I don't, then I'm, I am actually, I feel personally playing with nature. If, I, if I'm putting fish back the whole time, I'm playing games with a natural creature and that worries me. It worries me personally. And every now and again, just to justify what I do to myself, not anyone else, but to me, I have to take the odd fish and celebrate what, you know, the, what a wonderful, nutritious thing it is actually. Well, thank you. That was going to be my next point is that actually next season I will potentially consider taking a stocked fish because I'm beginning to understand now that if we do stock waters, it's important to rotate those fish yeah. and, and for the benefit yes. of the environment. I'm learning more and more about those side of things personally, but it's just something which I'm trying to get over from my own psyche. So here to your perspective is really quite interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, well, it's, it, and oddly enough, when you actually you know, go into the land of, 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 of complete catch and release to a, pack, to a point of mania, um, to hear somebody that is up there in front of an audience say, well, actually, have you thought about this? And generally speaking, people haven't. They've come to that conclusion because everybody else has done it rather than come to their own con natural conclusion. It's fascinating. It truly is. Now, I'm going to go to um, John Dart because I know John has got the very very good points to make so john you have the floor thank you kieran thank, thanks very much charles i'm not sure i've got good points to make but i think uh, i've enjoyed the the discussion i think we've got to distinguish before we speak whether we're talking about rivers or lakes as charles has said you know the lakes are all stocked and they have to be and that's a place where people can go and catch fish to take or put them back if they want to and so we need to distinguish between those and the rivers. And we have different sorts of rivers. We've got some which are sites of special scientific interest, others which are equally wonderful and hold high populations of wild fish. And we've got some rather degraded rivers where you have to stop to, if you want to catch anything, unless those rivers can be improved or until they can be improved. You also have different types of clubs. Now, some clubs, the Piscatorial has moved which I'm a member of since 2007 to um, probably of 20 miles of river, we stock about four or five now. And not all the members are happy, particularly some of the older ones. They'd like to have more stock fishing, I think. But um, more and more of the members are, are happy with uh, wild fish, maybe smaller fish and, um, and catch and release. Uh, whereas other clubs, you know, people who, who want to catch stock fish and uh, large fish can gravitate to other clubs where stocking is sort of quite a normal policy and people aren't worried about the wild trout population. So we have different clubs and different rivers for different, uh, different categories of fishermen. And I, I think we need to try and be clear that those uh, options are available. Personally, I, I like to take fish like um, 
like Charles, and I will go to our lakes for that, or I will take stock trout, and it's important as as the last speaker pointed out, to take the stock trout out because they don't overwinter very well and they do impact to some extent salmon uh, par, uh, salmon smolts, um, and uh, the same with, with you know, the large stock fish are piscivorous. They may not take as many fish as wild fish, but they do eat fish and they're not, you know, if you've got a river full of two and a half, three pound stock trout, they're going to impact the wild trout populations and on our rivers, which are on the whole, the Piscatorial rivers on the whole, have you know pretty good water quality and have been keepered to allow us to maintain wild fish populations. I think the stocking is is probably detrimental and really unnecessary. And more and more of the members have been educated to expect you know a two pound or one and a half pound fish to be a really good fish and nice to catch. And has that education? policy has that been well received do you think that's seeped through and, and been acknowledged by everybody well it's been discussed throughout and I had a member come to me um, maybe two years ago and say that he didn't think all this had been discussed but I actually put together um, if you've attended all the meetings we have two meetings a year and we have a journal and if you'd attended those and read the president's report in the journal all these policies had been talked through so, and that started in 2007 or around that time with a, a major makeover of how we were going to manage the rivers. And it's continued since. Um, and, you know, a lot of members don't like the way we manage the banks. There's, they're quite overgrown in places, but it does give the fish refuges. And we've got so much river that uh, I, I don't think the fact you, can, you can't fish every meter is, is important. And I think also you've got the cover, you've got habitat for bugs, you've got habitat for fish. And the nice thing is that the lovely thing about the Piscatorials is the fact that it's an all-embracive club and people forget this. It's not just a trout fishing club. It started life as being a celebration of angling. And, and you know, if you've got stock fish in a, in a river, you've got some, actually, people forget you've got some very happy pike too. And I don't think that's something that should be under underplayed. Um, John, thank you for that. Um, I've got so many questions coming in. I'm going to read some of these out, if I may. Um, it's from Andrew Rome. Andrew, how are you? It's lovely to hear from you. It's been way too long. Um, can everyone mute as uh, getting conversations in the background? So yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, but given my opening comments, how do you define a wild fish? Does the Wild Trout Trust define a wild, uh, wild trout? So, Rob, over to you. This is a cracker. How do you define a wild trout? I mean, it's quite simple. It's a fish that would have been bred and spawned in its natal river. And if it's sea trout coming back, they're absolutely wild. But how do you know that it's not coming? Uh, how do you know? Trout? That's a different question. How do you know? you need to be able to look carefully at that fish, hopefully just by holding it in the water. The wild fish have that proper torpedo shape. The wild fish will have fin perfect. They won't be slightly stubby. Well, a bit like the yes. itchin fish that I caught with white yes. little marks down it. Could, and all and this is both, when you're saying that, what people don't realize is you can have different strains of wild fish in different reaches of river. That's very, very normal. So the person who says that's nothing like the itching fish we catch higher up may just not have seen one well, this of your was actually, itching rivers fish. Rob, this was from the keeper and he knew. I mean, uh, and that was the thing. I couldn't differentiate. Had, that yeah, wild I, fish. I haven't been there, but if you caught a very healthy looking fish, it may have been a wild fish. But yes, some fish do overwinter and they do grow back on. We've had this debate with some very large fish. I think I saw a picture of something like a nine pound fish caught from the Mersey last right. autumn. And the conclusion was there that it appeared to have possibly been. I tell you what, that, that, that's a survivor. That fish. has just grown <laughs> on. It was a it was a very good fish for that person to be proud of. But it's mm -hmm. it's it's dorsal fin wasn't quite shaped right. No. It didn't appear to have that real kind of almost sea trout and salmon looking shape and, about and it. Brown it trout are actually very easy because they do get that little sort of little sort of fleshy null bit to either their pectoral or their dorsal or, or you know or indeed their tail. Yeah. I mean, we do see female fish where they're, they're, they've worn their tails down and sometimes you get fish that have been nipped by otters and you have these bites taken out of the tails. But also if you see a, 
a stocked fish, sometimes they don't seem to just shine. They don't seem to have that look about them that the wild fish do. I mean, stock fish can be pretty. I've caught the stock fish from the landborn and they're a very interesting fish, but I can spot them. Yeah, um, well, I think I think you can, but I, I, I'm, I'm playing a slightly the devil's advocate as I must. Mm -hmm. Right, we're gonna go on to another. Um, I agree with the chat from, here are Rob Stiffield. I agree with the chat from Wild Trout Trust, but anglers expect to catch fish. So we need to supplement the wild stocks. Um, this uh, is from Tim Smart. Um, what I think is wrong is that some waters are run for profit. If you pay 200 pounds for a day's fishing, especially if you're not a frequent angler, you expect to catch a lot of fish. Now, crikey, um, that is really throwing the door wide open for discussion. Gentlemen, have I got somebody that's going to come back at me on, um, do we equate, a, uh, I'm going to slightly paraphrase this by saying, do we equate a day's fishing with the amount that we pay for that day's fishing in fish? Someone's got to raise their hand to that. That's yep. almost like an incendiary bomb. Right can anybody see? Can yes. you see me? Yes, I can. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah as, as I often do, um, not living in the West Country, I come down to fish the test, and unfortunately it does cost the money that's been mentioned. But for me, it's, it's, I, I think generally on, on, on the whole topic, of, of, of size of fish. I think this is one situation where size doesn't matter. But I think what, what I expect when I do pay that sort of money and fish the test is that for me, fishing is not just actually catching fish, it's being in lovely surroundings. It's enjoying the river. Um, uh, it, it's, it's more important for me to see fish, whether I catch them or not, doesn't particularly bother me. Obviously, I'd like to catch one or two, and I do, but I think generally, for me to feel, go away feeling I've had my money's worth is that there are fish to see. When, when you do pay that sort of amount, are you quite happy to catch those fish and return them if you're allowed to do so? Yeah, and, and I very... You... I, I, it's interesting that I can't remember who it was that said, but I, my, when I go fishing, my wife always says, well, bring, bring back bring back one to eat for the table uh, and I very rarely do uh, partly because I don't you have to do so much to a trout to make it for me uh, interesting to eat um, but I, I, it just doesn't bother me taking a fish but having said that and listening I'm not sure if it was Rob was saying about rotation and taking at least one fish um, now I've forgotten what the question was um, uh, uh, it's about putting it right back. But it, it's interesting. The other point, sorry, just very quickly, the other point is I have a rod um, on a small river in Norfolk. Mm. And it takes me uh, about an hour to get there. And uh, it's interesting because there, it, it is more moving more in the direction of conservation, which is fine. But who who pays for that? Is it me and my subscription, annual subscription. And when I've traveled an hour uh, uh, to get to the river, um, again, I want to at least see fish. Uh, I'd like a fish to rise. I, it doesn't really bother me about actually landing one. If I've hooked one or if I've seen one, if there are fish rising, etc., that's fine. But there's a lot of the bank that is unfishable. And I just think the balance has is, is, is gone too far towards the conservation than to making it worthwhile, me paying the subscription each year and driving an hour to be disappointed and to sort of look at it from a point of view, well, I can only fish uh, part of the river because the, the, uh, uh, of access. So it is a difficult one. And, and, and I think if there was perhaps more communication, and that might be my fault because I don't go to the AGM because it's quite a drive, um, but unfortunately minutes are never uh, 
I don't get to see what what is discussed. But if if there was a more of an explanation why things were do, being done the way they were, but I don't know. It's um, it, 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 I think it's all a question of balance. And I and 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 it's interesting a point about wild fish and maintaining a river, uh, you know, to produce the insects I even to sustain stockfish. And and I think uh, fishermen do act as a catalyst for that. They might be not that aware of, of, of what they're actually doing or what needs to be done. But I think the very fact um, that, that we are going and, and pay for fish. And yes, I know when I fish the test that it's probably been stocked daily. Um, does it worry me? Not, not especially. I mean, the fishing is, I, I like to think as an average fisherman, um, and I don't think if I don't catch, it's not because I'm doing something wrong. Um, it, it, it's, it's just how it is. But I certainly wouldn't want it too easy. I don't want to be pulling them out all day long. I mean, that's just... But by and large, by and large, Jess, you're happy with stocking. You're not overly concerned about that stock fish, but you just, you, you, you like the experience as well. Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, the only other example I can give, I, I, I fished in New Zealand quite a bit. Uh, I lived there for a while uh, 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 and uh, fished the rivers. And of course, uh, as you may and other people uh, know that in, in the main, they're, 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 they're wild, in inverted commas. Um, and it's quite hard work, or can be, tramping in and, and going, going further upstream. Um, but the trophy has got to be big, and they are big there. Uh, I, I, but that's a different different situation, I think. And it's for also, me, I think, a, a different mindset too. I think you you yeah. do adapt, and I think that probably goes back to the original point that we can, as fly fishers, adapt. I'm going to move on because I've just yep. had. Yep. A, thank you, Jez, very very much indeed. Um, I've just had uh, something in from I, I, I presume Director of Wild Trout. Uh, or I presume, Sean, it's you, to address the question of how Wild Trout Trust defines a wild fish is no more complex than one that has been spawned naturally. To Charles's early point on whether wild fish are actually wild, the product of stocking, there's loads of evidence in the science, mostly from elsewhere in Europe, that the impact on wild fish from stocking depends very much on the intensity and longevity of stocking. But the general picture is um, that wild fish survive, albeit impacted, and continue <coughs> stocking has stopped. So uh, it, it slightly answers the question and slightly doesn't. Now, I'm going to go to my dear friend, Peter Hayes, who has his hand up. Peter, I can see you. There you are. Bless you. Just Over took me a second to unmute myself. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I... I I very much agree with John Dark um, in the sense that um, it's a question of horses for courses. Um, there are lots of different clubs in this country and they cater to different people who want different things. And uh, the bigger ones like uh, Piscatorials or Salisbury and District are able to accommodate both um, wild fisheries and um, stock fisheries. So um, I actually um, am privileged to belong to the Wilton Club, which I've been in for 35 years, um, and the Salisbury District, and the Crestbrook and Lytton, and the Services Club on the Avon. And they're, they're all different. The Wilton Club hasn't stopped for 10 years. Um, and more because of its restoration, in other words, freeing up the gravels in the main stem river, it now has four times the catch uh, of wild trout, and they are largely only wild trout, um, that it had 12 years ago, let's say, for argument. Um, but they are on average smaller, but the big fish are still there. Um, and you, if you're very careful, you can find them and see them and catch them. Um, Salisbury and District, um, in the areas where they're not stocking anymore, uh, again, the, my experience is that the average size has, has fallen, but the, there are more fish to catch. And also, um, 
I couldn't really fish last year, but I watched uh, a three and a half pounder that was definitely a wild fish uh, on Salisbury waters on a regular basis, uh, enjoying each other's company. Um, and, and there were attendant on that, on that fish in the same general area. There were another half dozen fish that were over two pounds. Um, and it's not an area that's stocked, and I don't believe they were wild, they were stocked fish. Um, the Crestbrook and Lytton does stock, but not very heavily at all, especially compared with historic stockings. Um, and um, it's a, a very, very interesting uh, fishery because the fish that are stocked there over winter very, very well indeed. You constantly, they mark, mark the stock fish or have done. So you can tell when you're catching a fish that's been in there for two years. And um, the season before last, um, when Don and I were putting our uh, book together, um, we spent between us five and a half hours on one fish over spread over two days, eventually caught it. it was one of the cleverest fish I've ever come across fishing anywhere, including New Zealand. And uh, it was a stock fish. It was marked, it had been put in two years before. And, and so what I have done myself is to slightly revise my opinion. My opinion used to be that if um, you're fishing for a fish that isn't fully equipped to evade you because it's a farmed fish, it's been habituated to human company, it's looking up for food um, and it's probably hungry, then that's a less satisfying um, and um, less um, a good thing to do. Um, Can I just stop you there? No, I'm, I'm reversed. I'm not, I'm not changing that opinion. That opinion is still true. What I am changing my opinion of is stocked fish um, and <laughs> how able they are. And, and everybody needs to bear in mind now that we have the trout and grading strategy, we're um, stocking in fertile fish. So we're Peter, not can I just stop the you there? Can I just stop you there? Because I've got yeah. a very interesting point that's coming from John Dart. Is it a fallacy that stock fish are more easily caught than wild fish? And I would, I would, I would actually suggest that once you've caught a stock fish, it become and it's put back, it becomes as difficult, if not harder, than many other fish. Um, they John. learn. Can you hear yes. me now? Am I here? You are. <laughs> yeah, you and I had this pre-discussion about this, about stock, are stock fish easy to catch? And I would actually contend that the easiest fish in the world to catch are small wild brown trout, especially when they're rising to the dry fly. I would agree with that. Yeah. I would agree with that. Um, we've <laughs> got, so I've got all sorts of stuff coming up. Sorry, Simon. I, I see it. Um, um, I've got one from Ulf, our old friend Ulf. If you want the view of a foreigner, I have a slightly different situation. I can't wait to hear what that... Ulf, what is that different situation? Uh, hello, everyone. Um, Morning, Ulf. How are you? Uh, I'm fine. I'm uh, seeing more of you than Alex. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, being one of the instigators to this wild versus fish from, from the last uh, meeting you had, I... I um, the situation here is that we have a lot of clubs and the clubs have moved more towards conservation all over. The, there hasn't been much stocking anywhere since I think the 70s. Uh, the rules and regulations have changed but also the clubs have changed and, and of course being in a club here is not we pay less in a year than you guys do per day for some of your clubs. So the situation is stiff. Um, and, oh, can I quickly ask you a question? Yeah. Whereabouts are you calling us from? Uh, I'm just outside of Gothenburg in the southern half of Sweden. Thank you. Uh, so, and, and, and we have seen over the last sort of two decades or so, a shift very much towards uh, that clubs spend a lot of time doing uh, conservation on, on, the, on the waters and uh, uh, a lot of members like me pay not all that much to be a member of the club and the normal sort of fee for a year here in Sweden is about a hundred pounds or 
something like that. But on the other hand, you, you're if you're not too old, there, there, there are, and you'd be happy to hear this, Charles, there are rules that sen senior members don't need to work as hard as the junior members need to do. But I everyone, is supposed, to, very, everyone is supposed to... It would be a very public admonishment. <laughs> now, so, so he, here it's, we have a different situation in, in many ways, because a lot of, we don't have any stockfish in rivers, virtually none at all, but the rivers that are stocked are so popular because of exactly what you were talking about before. The non-stocked rivers, the fish are smaller, the, the, they're more overgrown, they're harder to catch and uh, stuff like that. So the pressure on the stocked rivers where you pay 100 or 200 or 300 uh, a day to fish are much harder. We have one river that's not too far from here who has excellent wild trout fishing in the upper reaches mm -hmm. with really big trout. Uh, and um, the lower reaches. Actually, I can't never find you. will have to show you again. Uh, David, 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 can you mute David? David Little. David Little, can you mute yourself, please? It's all right, Charles, I've muted him. Okay. Um, um, Charles, I've got some questions here that people have written in. Okay. So, um, and I, I, sorry, everyone, I missed about 35 minutes, lost my internet signal. So did Graham McIntosh ask his question? Did that ring a bell, Charles? No, he didn't. Okay, well, I'll read Graham's question out. When rivers are having additional fish stocked into them, should these fish be restricted to trip lines only and if yes, why? I think that's a legal requirement now. Um, I don't think you can stock with anything other than trips. That's but absolutely true. So for those of you who don't know, um, as, as, as a fishery, you're only allowed to stock trip -like, triploid fish, which are essentially infertile. And that came out of the trout and grayling strategy, what, about 10, 12 years ago, Charles? I think less than that. I'd be bounded by uh, people like Nick, but uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, it was, yeah. it was actually, just, I would say uh, it's only you, about six years ago. Yeah, you can occasionally uh, stock uh, fully sexed diploid fish uh, in exceptional circumstances if there's been a fish kill or something and people want to reinstate um, you know, a, a, a native stock. Uh, so that it, it does very occasionally happen. Um, there is a lot of this, there was a lot of disquiet about the triploid strategy at the time. Um, there are a lot of people who believe that um, triploids do not act in the same way as wild fish. Um, and, uh, they, they, um, and so uh, personally, I think it's a pointless strategy. I think we we stop. We stop, we stop the trout streams for 150 years perfectly satisfactorily with fully sexed, uh, triplo, uh, fully sexed trout, and it didn't seem to do any harm. And this was just really a very strange environmental thing that came out of the uh, Environment Agency. They were forced to do it um, due to the Kyoto Agreement. And uh, uh, sadly, I think it's backfired on us. I think the quality of the stockfish are worse by virtue of the fact they're triploids. Okay. I think I, the one thing I would say on that one is I, I would actually disagree. I think that triploids do have a different uh, sort of way of, of um, working a river than, than uh, diploid. And I think they do feed in a very different way. I don't know if others have accommodated, you know, or, or can vouch for that, but. Uh, it, it does seem that they are very different. And, and it, it, that's, I suppose, the nub of the, the whole debate is, you know, should we be stocking many of these rivers at all? I mean, should there not be areas that are completely left wild, as we've found with the Saucepian District, with the Piscatorials and other waters? You know, and maybe we should look to zoning rather than anything else. It's just a thought, but it might help managing the situation. Um, yeah, it's an interesting thought about zoning. I mean, first of all, I mean, I've, I've got a couple more questions that I'll read yeah. out 
um, before we go. A couple, a couple of thoughts about zoning. The trouble with zoning is, I mean, there was famously a, a stretch of the River Itchen that has been wild forever. And um, the people there boast of the fact that they catch these tremendous stockfish that swim in for other waters. So it's very unfortunate if you happen to be zoned um, with well you know you like to stock your your bit of water and your next door neighbors don't so that's a yeah. bit unfortunate yeah. and secondly we have to remember that chalk streams in, entirely exist um due to stocking i mean there's no coincidence the victorians started fishing in the you know, early 1800s and they pretty soon discovered if you wanted a sporting river you had to stock it and so they didn't stock because they wanted to, they stocked because they bloody well had to. Uh, and that's pretty well the case here. I mean, I can tell you as someone who controls, <laughs> controls many hundreds of miles of the river, if I could stop stocking tomorrow, I would, because behind wages, it's my biggest single expense. Um, I'm gonna read a question here from Mike Harrison. Um, have you got your listening, have you got your listening ears on here, Charles? What is the research evidence that stocking has no impact on river ecology? The precautionary principle suggests that we shouldn't stock unless we know it won't do harm. In other words, positive evidence, not just absence of negative as evidence. Well, I, I think that that's been answered by our lovely colleagues in the Wild Chart Trust, um, that, you know, there is significant impact because of the populations of fish moving wild fish from existing lies. And uh, I, I'm gonna, I, I think we really ought to go to the people that actually have done research on this, which is the Wild Trout Trust, and suggest that they take up, take up that, that discussion point. Well, I think we can take it up another time. I mean, I'm in disagreement with the Wild Trout Trust on that. There's a recent paper that suggests that uh, wild fish and stockfish leave completely different lives, and there is no evidence of damage between the two. And I think the simple fact that our rivers stop, you know, lasted for 150 years uh, with stocking our wild fish is evidence enough that there is no negative impact. And, and you know, of all the things that assail our rivers, um, it's pollution and abstraction. Uh, those are the real, real the dangers, not, not a few stockfish. Um, Charles, can I come back in there? Sean, I've got my hand up, but... Um... Uh, Sean, I'm just going to, I'm just, I've got one more question I want to ask from Tim Smart. These are people who've written in, so I think they should be allowed uh, for a shout. Um, my question relates, this is from Tim Smart. Thank you, Tim. My question relates to catch and release. I prefer to fish waters which practice catch and release. I would say that 50% of the fish I catch on the rivers are stopped. Is catch and release appropriate for those fish? It is not permitted on most still waters where all fish are stocked. Well, I, certainly I would disagree with that last statement. There's more and more still waters turning over the catch and release, our major reservoirs and what have you. What I would say about it is, and I suspect I would say something rather similar to, to rivers, is that um, where the conditions actually are conducive, yes, put fish back. Understand how to put fish back. Anglers are completely ignorant still of handling fish properly. They should really, really start looking at how coarse fishes, especially carp fishes and especially pike fishes, put due care into their, their practices. We're appalling, frankly. And um, we should keep, uh, Chris says it all, keep them wet. You know, he, that's his tagline, keep him wet. Now, as to times of year, I think we must look at times of year when there's low oxygen, dee da dee da dee da and say it's not not correct to do so. Um, I would definitely not even consider putting fish back on a reservoir where if the water was too warm because the chances of survival are negligible. They really are negligible. In my humble opinion, that's true. I think that's a good point. Actually, John Stevens, one, our, one of our guides, has a fantastic thing about catch and release. He said, you, can only, you should only keep a fish out of the water for as long as you can hold your breath. Yeah, I've got <laughs> another person who says sigh, but it's the same thing. Oh, um, but I would actually, I, it's actually surprisingly 
surprising how res resilient trout are to catch and release. We've got, you know, as, as many of you know, at Nerville Wallet Mill, we have our teaching lake, which is stuffed full of rainbow trout that get caught and released a huge amount. Um, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's I, I, I say this abs with absolute truth, it is very, very, very rare for me to go out the following morning even after a day when 20, 30, 40 fish have been caught to actually see a dead fish. They, they are remarkably resilient fish. I, I think um, obviously, you know, it's slightly different for us because, you know, we've got guides and people have been. Um, can, we, can we go back? Um, can we go back really to, to I, I'd love to hear um, uh, what Sean's got to say about, uh, about what, you know what, Simon? You you opened up about um, uh, stocking and um, and competition. Sean, are you with us? Yes, thanks, Charles. Uh, forgive my title of my little box there. I'm not self-aggrandizing. It's just I don't know how to work out to change my bloody name on it. But I think to speak to Simon's point about uh, stocking in the context of all the other things that are impacting our rivers, that's a very very moot point. You know, there are loads of really really big picture issues. There's climate change, there's water consumption, all those big things that are knackering our rivers. But to come back on that point about the science, the science is unequivocal that there are impacts from fertile stocking on wild populations of fish, salmonids, both trout and salmon. And you don't have to believe me, but in, the, in Britain and Ireland, UK and Ireland, we are blessed with probably the top six or seven uh, salmonid population geneticists um, in the world. And if you ask any of those guys about the interaction be between fertile stocked fish and wild fish, they will, with a single voice, say there are significant negative impacts. That bit, that's be very, very clear. I think, Sean, what the point was, though, it was that the infant, infant fertile um, I was going to say infantile, but I better not. Uh, infertile fish, the triploids over diploids, and what well, impact they may have. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the one thing we can say about triploids, however, of course, is that at least it removes that um, genetic introgression interference issue because they won't spawn as long as they are triploids, which is, so, again, perhaps. So in, 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 in many but ways, that supports what Simon was saying, actually, um, playing the devil's advocate. You know, I mean, I will jump in, Sean. I mean, when we got to the trout and salmon grading strategy, we all asked the question of the scientists behind it. Can you define what is a native wild brown trout? And it, the, that definition never arrived. No, but of course, I mean, as, as Peter Charles himself has alluded to earlier on, stocking actually muddies that water somewhat because you get a well-mended fish that's a couple of you know, two winters in the river, and it's bloody difficult to tell apart. And that's always going to be our problem. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I've always wanted to catch a Kennet greenback, and I think I may have done it once, may have done it, but I don't know. Um, uh, it, it's just one of those things. Simon, we're up to the hour, my friend. We are up <laughs> to us. Um, Charles, is it possible to chip in on the um, the stocking debate, please? I've got some data. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm actually going to suggest that we do we take one more question, Simon. Otherwise, w this will go on and on and on. And I think we could probably even have part two, actually. Um, so, uh, Mike, uh, yes, off you go. Um, Charles, thank you very much. Um, I fish the Livington River uh, in the New Forest, and we have data going back many years. I'll look at the focus on the last 10 years. We started stocking a pr proportion of triploids in 2011, increasing from 20% over the next five years to 100% in 2015. Over that period, the number of wild fish, wild brown trout caught, increased slightly, but whether it's significant, I don't know, from 121 to 177. In 2017, we then started reducing the amount of stockfish that we put in. We, put, we typically, uh, in the years from year 2000 up to 2017, we generally stocked around 550 fish. We started reducing that to the point that uh, last year, partly influenced by COVID, we only stocked 300 fish. 
the number of wild trout caught, I'll remind you, 177 in 2015. Last year was 344, average over the last three years. The actual number in 2020, wild fish was 419. That's a huge increase in wild fish over that period. Nice. Four times. That's fascinating. Four times. I mean, if love is drawn records like that, I mean, but we're back to that old thing of habitat. It may well be that the habitat is, is more conducive to, you know, what you have there. So, I mean, it, there are so many, it's, as Sean said, there's so many variables in all this. And Rob, you, I think you alluded to the same thing, that there are so many things you've got to take into account here. It's not just a simple case of bunging fish in and then watching how it all goes. You've got to nowadays, because of the pressure on these rivers, the pressure on everything um, from, from, climate through to the ecology of the river that's all to, to the biomass everything has got to be taken into account so it's um simon i don't know are you still with us i am still oh, with you good. i never know <laughs> <laughs> hey, come I, I would say mike and thank you for that I, the, the, I, I i really str I, one of these one of the worst things about catch and release is that that catch records now are largely a work of fiction. I, I'm not casting any aspersions on your club, Mike, but it's really difficult, I can tell you, as a river manager to actually know what's going on in a, in a river because I know people come back at the end of the day and they just, I've seen it. <laughs> as a guide, I've seen it. People write complete rubbish in, in fish record books. So it's really difficult as a fishery manager to know nowadays. I mean, you know how many fish have been killed because people are pretty... So, yeah, that's pretty obvious. But people, I, I've seen people go, yeah, it's a bit like golf strokes. They go, and oh, how many fish did I catch today? Was it eight or 10? Yeah, I think it, I think it was 10. Well, <laughs> well, they, they were a while, they take. Um, we had lovely Mr. Little from, from my old stamping ground of Buell Water um, join us. And um, we always said that the greatest work of fiction um, was actually the record book in the Buell Water Lodge. <laughs> Um, because nothing was ever particularly accurate in that. I think we may have got part two of our discussion because Kieran Nason has said, I've heard a lot of focus on southern rivers, uh, waters. What is the opinion of those further north? And I think we've got our north-south divide, which would be fascinating. Okay, it's, so we go, it's going to be it's going to be the red wall versus the chalk wall. I think so. I think so. Yes. All yes. right. Well, I well, I'll just I'll I'll just say a few words. Thank you so much, everyone who's joined us. Uh, we, I, I I've scrolled through and see all of you there. Thank you. I like all of you who've got the really pat, posh backdrop of a, of of rivers. Tony and Don in particular. Thank you. Looks very lovely. I think I'm going to have to do the same. Uh, sorry, I wasn't with you earlier. And um, but first, finally, Charles. Thank you so much for holding the meeting together so well. Uh, truly, I, I I'm I'm not worthy to be part of this with you. And thank you for. Uh, making it happen. Yeah, but but I, I would like to add just to everybody, thank you, because uh, like every good debate, everybody aired an opinion and everyone had an opinion and they it was a deeply and heartfelt opinion and it's sincere and that's the nice thing about a debate and I, I, like most, it hasn't drawn a conclusion. Not that I felt, you know, we ever would do on this. It's a very difficult one, but I think in our heart of hearts, all of us would love to catch an indigenous wild brown trout. That's what we aspire to do as a kid. That's what I still aspire to do coming up for my wait for it 68th birthday. Um, I've always, you know, it, they've always thrilled me. Um, there is a, a beauty and a magnificence about that fish that still holds the attraction after all these years. And it will never dwindle, it will never diminish. And I, you know, even if sometimes I kid myself that it may be not stop when perhaps it was. But um, thank you all very, very much indeed. All right. Thank you. You believe Charles. in Father Christmas then? I believe in Father Christmas. Still. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for all the input. Bye, Peter. Bye-bye. Cheerio.